contenders Kenny Brack and Elio Castroneves must finish well to extend the fight. DeFerrin and Castroneves excel on street courses, while Brack does not. Will it be DeFerrin's paradise or Castroneves and Brack's hope? We'll know in 182 miles. down under surfers paradise australia round 20 of 21 for the card fedex championship series today the champion might be crowned at the grand prix of australia well jill deferrin in fact can wrap up the championship if he stays away from trouble and ends the race with a 23 point advantage smooth and clean smooth that's the deferrin way clean is up to everybody else Kenny Breck found the wall early in qualifying, but was able to recover and qualify 13th. Breck comes into the Surfers event having led more than twice the number of laps of DeFerrin this season, but he'll have to have a great race to keep his championship hopes alive heading into the season finale next weekend at Fontana. Let's take a look at the way that they qualified down under. Roberto Moreno has the pole. It's his 100th start. Jill DeFerrin. Starting second, failed to finish a single lap in the last two years. Paul Tracy is fourth for the fourth year in a row. Scott Dixon is the highest qualified rookie. Elio Castroneves, there he is in 11th. Kenny Breck starts in 13th. Adrian Fernandez won from 17th last year and starts in 17th today. And Alex Barron replaces Max Wilson at the wheel of that car. Let's take a look at the track here at Surfers. It's the song, second longest circuit on the car tour at 2.795 miles. Unusual for a street course in that it has four long straightaways where speeds can reach in excess of 190 miles an hour. But those four straightaways are punctuated by four chicanes. The drivers will have to be very aggressive over the curbs. That's tough on gearboxes, and especially that first chicane, turn number one. We've seen lots of action there in the years past. 65 laps, fuel is critical, trying to figure out that strategy. You can make it on a single stop if you get the right number of yellows and everything goes just right. Well, Chief Stewart Chris Neifel find Paul Tracy and dock him three championship points, put him on probation for comments that he made for several different incidents at Laguna Seca, including this one on pit road. I had a bent suspension from, uh, from when uh, Castro Neves turned me around in the pit lane. And what's more upsetting about that is how Chris Neifel runs the series. I mean, this series would be better off if they had a circus clown as a, crew, as a chief steward because the job he does is a joke. Well, along with everything else, that little comment cost Paul Tracy $50,000. Well, now the field has already begun to roll down under, and we want to take you back just one year ago. Jan Bikas, you remember the start and Jill DeFerrin's problem then. Yeah, and I think that Parker mentioned that there's a lot of action in turn number one. Here is why. Montoya on the left, DeFerrin on the right. They make contact. And the reason, Paul, you don't break in a straight line coming into this first chicane. And when you have two rows of cars, they have to get down to single file for that first chicane. So the field now anticipating the green flag as they come off the long run alongside the Pacific Ocean and then turn back up heading north and head for the start finish line. Australia is underway. DeFerrin leads him into turn one. Moreno drops back into second place. DeFerrin doing just what he needed to do. Got around the nemesis of last year. Picks up the lead of the race. And championship contenders Castro Nevis and Kenny Breck also oh. threw safely through the first two chicanes. Yeah, but not so for Casey Mears. He's off very early on, starting well in the back of the field. And this course is long enough, Paul, to where they certainly ought to be able to get him out of harm's way before these guys get around. But amazing, those guys were lined up nearly perfectly, and all the front runners got through there nearly unscathed. Well, despite what you just suggested, Jan, they've gone to a full course yellow already. 
on the first lap because of Casey Mayer's position on the course. You can see the, the double yellow flags, which tells them that the pace car will come out and the field will slow. Let's go back and take a look at what happened to Casey Mears. Coming down into that first chicane, gets in way, way too deep on the brakes hard, turns around into the outside barrier. Another view of this. It's a deceptive corner. It bends back to the right. The entry itself is nearly blind. You've got to be on the brakes early, especially on cold tires, full fuel. His first start at Surfer's Paradise, and he just missed it. But surprising, and I would mentioned this, Paul, this course is long enough. I'm very surprised they couldn't get that car out of harm's way. And since you already know there's a lot of trouble in turn one, why not have a crane? Well, there's another thing, too, that uh, in the past, they have, for the most part, always told the drivers that they wouldn't go that full course caution until the last couple of turns before the start finish, just so they have an opportunity to pull it off course. Apparently, they saw something that we didn't and decided that they needed that full course caution. This ESPN Speed World coverage of the Grand Prix of Australia is being brought to you by FedEx, proud sponsor of the FedEx Championship Series. And by Nextel, how business gets done. In Australia, just inland, there's some beautiful waterfalls and then the outback. But of course, the cart championship series is at surfers paradise anticipating the green flag and Jan Bikas we uh, are under a full course caution and the reason was Casey Mears who got in trouble early on coming into the first corner on the coming outside just gets in chicane. way too hot way, way locks up the brakes spins into the barrier on the outside but on that opening lap we saw Paul Tracy and Alex Tagliani move up a spot each and then they moved back as well. Michael Andretti fell back as well as Patrick Carpentier. And Jan, uh, several guys pitted when that happened. Yeah, and that's generally what you would see, Paul, from the back of the field is that it's time to gamble if you're not running up front. So Fernandez, Nakano, Kanan, Takagi, Herta, and Guzelman all took advantage and came onto pit road for a splash of fuel. Of Paul Page, Parker Johnstone, Jan Bikas with you. Gary Gerald has the weekend off. Our pit coverage will be coming from Network 10, Australia. Jill DeFerrin will lead the field back to the green flag. And, of course, he is simply looking to stay out in front. If he can do that. And his nearest competitors, the only two real competitors that he has on this with the penultimate race of the season, Kenny Breck and Elio Castroneves will not be able to really mount any kind of a charge whatsoever. We talk a lot about fuel strategy, but at our last race at Laguna Seca, Max Pappas pitted five times, set a cart record from coming from the farthest position back, all the way back in 25th to win that race. So these drivers at the back that Jan mentioned, Takagi, Herda, Kanan, Fernandez, and Guzelman, all trying to top up that tank. They're not really worried about track position at the very beginning of the race. They bring it up, lined up nose to tail. Again, the green flag is the one time when you have an opportunity to really get around somebody. It's the closest of contact that you will have with someone. Green flag comes out again. We're racing once again. DeFerrin timed that restart perfectly. Pulls a bit away from Moreno. That's Tracy in third place. Cristiano D'Amata, then Franchitti, then Alex Tagliani. See D'Amata having a look down the inside of Tracy on that restart. Now the meat in the team green sandwich there. And, Paul, you mentioned about the jump forward to Farron. What a great example of the driving ability of these guys to come off and put 900 horsepower. Here comes DeMata. Cristiano DeMata makes a move down the inside. Oh, it's going to be tight on the exit. They continue to go side by side. DeMata battles and finally gets around Tracy. Franchini pulls up right on the back end of Tracy. DeMata had a great launch off that second chicane, had a great amount of exit speed, was up, able to outbreak Paul. Difficult place to pass and hold a pass going into that back section. One of the few more traditional parts of the track. Concrete lined, very steep crown of the road, blind on the exit. Excellent pass by Cristiano DeMata. And you talk about that launch. That's kind of what I was talking about on the restart. In the final hairpin, they get all the way down to 40 miles an hour. Then they stand on it on cold tires, or in this case, not as warm a tires as they have now. And that takes some real driving ability. And when we show you the field summary in the upper left-hand corner, 
we have highlighted the car number of those three cars who are in the championship contention. And you see that Cart is now scoring. Casey Mears as out of competition. Dario Franchitti now all over the back of his teammate Paul Tracy. Interesting, though, that Cristiano D'Amata got that great launch. The only driver with a Lola chassis at the front of this field. One of the things Cristiano told me is that he's just so impressed at how well that Lola puts the power down. And of street course, that becomes very, very important. Leaders now completed four laps. You'll also see some varying styles. You'll see some guys that think you should hop the curbs in every chicane. And then there's others like Castro Neves who say, I don't think that's the approach I want to take. I want to be smooth and miss the chicanes. If you do that, you can actually run the car a little bit lower. So you have a different setting if you're a curb bouncer as opposed to somebody who misses them. Well, let's in fact talk about that a little bit because we've already had a report of one spectacular gearbox failure, that in the car of Jill DeFerrin earlier in the weekend. And if you keep bouncing off those curves and running this rough circuit and slamming the gears, your chances of making it to the end aren't all that good. Well, Michael Andretti set the mark years ago. They had those famous pictures back in 94 when he won Renard's first race right here at Surfer's Paradise where he's got to be three, four feet in the air. When I first drove this course, I was trying to be very clean, very tidy, and I said, well, that's not working. So I started jumping the curves, taking a lot more entry speed into the course, picked up a huge amount of time. I think Cash Nevis is really one of the few drivers, one of the few drivers at the front anyway, that's able to employ a smoother style and yet maintain a reasonable lap time. Yeah, and Paul, I think what you were hinting at is for somebody like the fair, and you said he has to be clean. Well, if you're going to be clean, you want to be out in the lead where your view is not obstructed, and then you can make that choice. You know what? I don't have to bounce over curbs. i got to keep this car in one piece. Keeping an eye on Alex Tagliani, currently running sixth and still looking for that victory. The young man who started out so very strong in this series, and we've seen some moments of brilliance from him, but he has yet to find a position on the top of the podium. Tagliani had a problem in qualifying. The engine not running quite the way it should have. He's also nursing a tendonitis problem with his right wrist. Suffered all the way through Laguna Seca. A lot of ice, a lot of medical attention. And at this track, especially if you are a curb jumper, that can really, really make it for a long, difficult day as you're hopping these curbs. It's very warm, very humid outside. And your right hand is so busy with 32 shifts a lap, straining against two and a half G's of quartering, three G's of breaking. Very, very tough physically. Back to the front of the field, second place, Roberto Moreno. You know, Paul, if I was to Farron, I think I'd let Moreno go. I don't think that I would work hard to stay in the lead of this race. I mean, maybe for the first five laps, but then I would, if Moreno's pushing, I'd let him go because sometimes it's easier to follow than it is to be checking your mirrors and being pushed. And you look at the interval that DeFerrin and Moreno have pulled out, and I think you're right, Jan. All he has to do is just keep Breck somewhere around him, and he's got the championship wrapped up. So underway with five laps now completed by Jill DeFerrin as he chases a championship in Australia. It's Honda and then two Toyotas. We'll be back. Welcome back. As the view is from Scott Dixon's car, Paul Page, Parker Johnstone, Jan Vikas with you. Gary Gerald is off this weekend. The race, Surfers Paradise, Australia. Jill DeFerrin is the leader. Nothing has changed at the front of the field. But a little further back, Elio Castroneves has fallen down a position, and that puts him just in front of Kenny Breck. So two of the championship contenders running together on the course, that's probably not what they would like to be doing. They really probably don't want to find themselves having to race one another, at least this early on. We've talked about the championship battle. Scott Dixon, born in Australia, raised in New Zealand, hoping to lock up the Rookie of the Year title. This weekend at Surfer's Paradise has a lot of his family, a lot of friends that have come to watch him at his first appearance here. You can see his quick hands coming onto that pit straight with the onboard. And Paul, this is what you're talking about. If Kenny Breck starts really pushing, and you could tell by the line of Castro Neves, he is certainly aware that Kenny Breck is there. He's trying to drive defensively, but oh boy, you can't have any contact here. That would, If anything happened to these two cars, all of a sudden, we've got a champion. And we talked about Cash Nevis and how he likes to stay so clean, but he has been crashing the curbs. As you said, Jan, you can see him trying to protect that inside line under braking. Watch him bounce the curbs here. 
so much for being nice and tidy, but look at the exit he got on Kenny Breck coming off that very fast number three chicane. So keeping an eye on those championship contenders just moments ago, Network 10 caught up with Casey Mears out of the race. I just got in too deep. It was just uh, kind of caught me off guard. You know, uh, I needed to slow down a lot more than I did. I just made a rookie mistake, basically, and, and uh, you know, hopefully I learned from it. I mean, it was just too bad. You know, we stayed out of, managed to stay out of trouble all weekend. Our main goal was just to get through the race, you know, and, and uh, I went in there very conservative, but obviously not conservative enough for how much guys were going to pack up. So uh, just a huge mistake on my part, and, and uh, I feel really sorry for the guys. You know, like I said, we've made it to this whole weekend so far, and Skade, other people couldn't say that, you know, and our main goal was just to make it through the race this weekend. and. You know, I'm I just uh, fortunate to be here, though. I want to thank Mona and Morris to, uh, for supporting me and, and getting me in the seat, and also uh, Pioneer and Wilcom and Sard, all those guys. I know they had a, they had high hopes for maybe doing well here. So, uh, you know, we'll go get them at Fontana. Tough luck. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. So Casey Mears first scored out in Australia. And the thing he's talking about, he thought he was conservative. Remember, Casey Mears went from winning Indy Lights races and starting at the front, now going to the very back of a 26-car field. Well, the accordion effect takes some getting used to. The cars slow dramatically when you're at the back of the field, and that really does take some getting used to. Especially with the compression you've got going into that first chicane, when you've qualified 24th the way Casey did, you have to break much, much earlier than the last time you were out on the circuit in qualifying or even in this morning's warm-up. Back up at the front of the field, Jill DeFerrin leading for the seventh time this year. Four in a row in terms of leading laps in a race for Jill DeFerrin. Roberto Moreno right behind him driving for Pat Patrick. And again, the classic battle. Penske and Patrick laid out here for us. They're running similar lap times, but interestingly, the fast laps at the moment are being done at the back of the field. Those who came in and topped up for fuel are running considerably faster. So the strategy may already be at play here. The guys are just kind of in the front, falling into a rhythm, controlling the track position. The guys at the back are going for it. And I'm surprised, other than Casey Mears' bobble at the beginning of this race, it's been very clean. The last few races that we've seen at Laguna, Houston, Vancouver, for a while there, with the number of incidents that we had and the aerobatics that we saw at Laguna, I thought we were having a casting call for the sequel to Driven there for a while. Well, they are kind of reporting to us, listening to a report coming from the track, that uh, there was a complaint, at least, that Jill DeFerrin may have jumped the start. That's been re-examined by race control, and they have determined it to be a legal start. Andretti, who fell back to seventh place behind Tagliani. Now trying to work Tagliani, and Serbia comes offline and slows down. Well, Serbia slowed well before the corner. Remember that he was up there just ahead of the battle of Castroneves and Breck, and suddenly he's pulled out of the fight. Obviously, he's got some sort of problem, just went straight through the chicane looking for a cutout in the wall. For Brian and Herta. looking back to Brian Herta, 24th place. Thanks, Park. No problem. And there's Oriel Servia off the edge of the course. Uh, surprised he's staying in the cockpit because it looks like, well, now it looks like he's getting ready to climb out. Came to surfers with only one car. The primary car destroyed at Laguna Seca, sent back to England for repairs. Here is third place Cristiano D'Amata. Won the first race of this season, has not won since. Only two victories in his career, Chicago a year ago and Monterey, Mexico at the start of this year. In fact, when you go back and think about that race at Monterey as we watch Tracy and Franchitti come through and here comes Tagliani followed by Michael Andretti. You go back and think about that first race of the year, Parker and Jan, it was at that race that Jill DeFerrin was terribly ill before the start of the race high fever chills he was shaking they did iv fluid therapy on him to help him out uh several people said well maybe you ought to just sit this one out he did not he finished second despite being very sick 
and having done that has certainly been a substantial help to him being in this championship position today. Yeah, I think that is just, that's how these drivers are wired. And we're looking at Michael Andretti. That reminds me of he and Paul Tracy. It is amazing how they both run really well after having been in trouble and been placed on probation. Paul Tracy running in fourth, Michael Andretti currently not on probation. Maybe he wishes he was. But sometimes when you have adversity, not feeling well or under pressure, these guys really respond. You've seen that Adrian Fernandez in the past having the flu at Motegi coming back and win. But I think you look at Gilles de Ferrin, Paul, the fact that he hasn't dropped back. He hasn't let Moreno go by. This guy's a champion. He's a racer. He's not going to give away the lead if he doesn't have to. De Ferrin and Roberto Moreno staying in touch with one another, but now beginning to pull away from third place. Cristiano D'Amato, about 100 yards, separates them back to D'Amato. It remains the same at the front of the field. De Ferrin, Moreno, D'Amato, Honda, Toyota, Toyota. Join host Chris Berman and analyst Tom Jackson as they break down all the NFL action on NFL Primetime. Sunday night at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. The most comprehensive NFL highlight show on television. NFL Primetime presented by Miller Lite every Sunday at 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. For more, log on to ESPN.com. The run continues. The Cart FedEx Championship Series, Surfers Paradise Australia, the ride here with Bruno Junquera. Nothing's changed at the front of the field. DeFerrin, Moreno, DeMata, the top three. Junquera is back in 17th. And we're going to take you back up to the front of the field. There's the separation. DeFerrin to Moreno. Just a little over a second on that last lap, the interval between DeFerrin and Moreno. Moreno's been closing it up the last few laps. You see Jill looking in his mirror. Just wants to make sure that Moreno's not close enough to have any problems with possible contact. I don't know. I think if he does get close enough, he just might let him through. You never know. Yeah, that's the question I was going to ask. Say you are DeFerrin. <laughs> don't, don't you think, all right, if he really charges me, I'm not going to really fight him. Let's see or that. can you afford to do that? You know, I always preferred, if I was in this situation, it's the best place to be is always the front. You can control the pace, your visor stays clean, and I never wanted to win a championship without winning a lot of races and dominating every single event. If you're Roger Penske and you're advising Gilles Deferrin, I would think that if you had any concern at all about this interval closing, that certainly given the opportunity, if you couldn't get it to the pit stop, so you'd let Moreno through. Yeah, and of course, it's, it's tough to get inside Deferrin's head because he knows how much he has in hand. We don't know sitting here if he's working the car at seven tenths of his ability or nine or ten tenths. If he's pushing nine or ten tenths of his ability, then you think seriously about letting Moreno through. But if you're really just kind of cruising, you don't worry about it. The other thing is that Moreno is Brazilian as well as DeFerrin, and he is very experienced, and oftentimes he's a guy you can trust. Well, but the watch says on that last lap that Moreno pulled in another three-tenths of a second on Gilles Deferrin. You can see Gilles looking to the left, checking his mirror. You don't want, you want to get distracted. You can see he's actually a little offline there, moving to the inside, coming into this next chicane. I don't know. If you're Roberto Moreno, you're looking for a job, you're looking for another race victory, and that's the perfect way to cap the end of a season. You have two completely different goals here in mind. Mean back, meanwhile, back at 11th and 12th, Kenny Breck, Elio Castroneves. Carpentier with the exit of Oriol Servia, who had a gearbox problem. Here comes Castroneves. Oh, uh oh, be careful. So watch Breck. Breck's going to go to the inside. Now he comes around. No, nope, Breck can't do it. Breck got on the binders pretty hard, too. Well, that's because Castroneves certainly lost a lot of speed, but he happened to lose the speed right in a place where there's only one lane. <laughs> and in that 5 6 combination, there's no way Kenny Breck could get a better exit because he tied him up for so long. So Kastnev has maybe flat spotted his tires a little bit there, but didn't give any substantial advantage to Kenny Breck, just gave Carpanti a little bit of breathing room. Down the inside, he doesn't have this pass made, and there's no way Patrick's going to let him down the inside. Breck now has a lot of extra speed, but he can't utilize it. Kastnevis has a great exit coming off the corner, maintains that advantage over Brush. You know, one thing I'm wondering there is that looked like a pretty good brush with something left front of Elio Kastnevis. Whether or not it was just the pylon or whether or not it was a little more serious and he brushed the wall. We'll probably find out pretty quickly. Right now, he is able to hold 
Kenny Breck off, so you assume that everything's okay on the left front. Yeah, and, and, and to just tie up the Orioles' Servia, gearbox failure, he's out of the car, he is okay. Interesting for Kenny Breck, had he not been so close to Castro Neves, he could have held back and taken advantage of that. So it's crazy. Sometimes you're better off being right on somebody to take advantage. Other times you're not. And if you were much closer, he may have been right in the middle of the accident. And that's the thing you have to be careful of. Now watch Castro Neves' left front. Right. I think he's uh, clear there, but you yeah, can see clear. Breck. If that had been a different sort of corner, Breck would have had a great exit on Castro Neves. There's also the championship implications here. You've got second and third in the championship with Breck and Castro Neves. You've got the teammate to DeFerrin who's out leading this thing and looking to secure his second championship in a row. Here's the last winner of the series. Max Pappas won at Laguna Seca in an interesting race that was turned totally on fuel strategy. Yeah, it was that cagey strategy from Mark Johnson and the Ray Hall team stopped five times when everybody else is trying to do it in two stops. They called a brilliant race. They hit the yellows just right. Max Pappas won his second race of the year. But when you talk about stopping five times, those were all early, and it was the not bringing him in, which was the big roll of the dice, which would not have worked except for Cart having a rule that a race cannot go over two hours in length. Some other people forgot about that, and we're still working on the race distance on laps. And it worked for him. And I think Christian Fittipaldi summed it up the best. His quote after the Laguna race is, hey, these days you need more than just a good car. You have to have a crystal ball. And that's pretty much the way a lot of these races have turned out. And despite that great run and the victory for Max Pappas, he's still a driver that currently is unemployed for next season. And Team Rahal, while announcing Jimmy Vassar as a driver for next year, have yet to indicate not only who will be in the second car, but for that matter, whether or not there will be a second car. It is presumed that there will be, but they'd really like to amass some sponsor dollars before they do that. And we talked briefly about that two-hour rule. In case you're wondering, why do you have a two-hour rule? It has to do, it came in many years ago, it has to do with driver fitness. They had a really hot summer, and they decided that on a, a course like this, on a hot, humid day, that they didn't want people running into fitness issues, so they said, we are going to not have races longer than two hours in length. And it's commonly believed it has something to do with television, but that is not the case. It is Cart's decision in the rule book, been there for a long time. They just don't want them to go longer than two hours. Well, that's a rule they really need to reevaluate, I think. And what, what confirms it, though, is that that rule doesn't apply to red flag time. So if this, you just subtract any red flag, it didn't exist. And, and I think the reason Parker says that rule needs to be reevaluated is these guys would have absolutely no problem nowadays with their fitness level running longer than two hours. It's much different than it was 10 years ago. I've been driving vintage Formula One cars during the summer, and it's amazing how much the physical loads have changed over the years. The older cars, very easy to drive physically, still took a lot of concentration, but these cars are very, very demanding. So we're anticipating the pit stops in a very few laps at Surfers Paradise Australia. There's your top five. Jill DeFerrin has led from the drop of the green. Now the Baseball Players' Choice Awards are voted on by the players themselves. Nominees include Barry Bonds, Randy Johnson, Ichiro, A-Rod, and Roger Clemens. Tune in Sunday at 6 Eastern on ESPN to find out who the players think was the best player of the year. The Major League Baseball Players Association Players' Choice Awards, Sunday night at 6 Eastern on ESPN. For more, log on to ESPN.com. The run continues at Surfers Paradise, Australia. Jill DeFerrin has now completed the 20th of his 65 laps. He's in the lead. And we do have a report as well, pit stops beginning here with Franchini in, and a report that Christian Fittipaldi may have brushed the wall. I don't think you pit here, Paul, unless you maybe had a brush yourself. This is too early to pit unless you had a problem with your car. So we hear about Christian Fittipaldi maybe with a brush, you never know. Maybe that means there was something going out on the racetrack that affected Franchini. And Franchini observes the speed limit to the end of the pit lane, now begins to accelerate. Bruno Junquera also pitted just ahead of Franchini. With the open test on Friday being in the rain and a lot of drivers not spending a lot of time on the track, this is the most dry time full tank running they've had so far. 
for a lot of these guys, they might be finding towards the end of this fuel run that the balance of the chassis has gone off, that especially if they're in a tight traffic situation, they might just gamble and come in early. Yeah, like what I should say is that he did not need to come in because of fuel. But like you said, Parker, if your car's not right, by stopping, you're in the window now. So you still only have to stop one more time. If something's not right, go ahead and get it changed. Sure, and if you flat spotted the tires under braking or something else, why not? And it may help you with track position, get you out of a fight you don't want to be in. You just pray the yellow doesn't come out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Report from Surfer's Paradise, hot. Temperatures in the high 80s, humid. Light offshore breeze. Track temperature up to 130 degrees Fahrenheit with this crowd, the largest that they've seen, approaching 300,000 people over the four-day event. It hasn't been all that pretty in the past uh, couple of days. Uh, Friday, it's after all in the tropics, and they had a torrential downpour. They started to get the track dry. It rained again. One of those uncomfortable days in racing. DeFerrin now almost two seconds ahead of Moreno with some reports that they're laying out for DeFerrin. And again, you should be able to go farther on fuel than this unless they're going with the crank up the fuel, use the max qualifying setting. Mimo Gidley also coming on to pit road. So there may not be much conservation going on out there. These guys are flat, got the fuel cranked up. And we've seen that from DeFerrin so many times in the past. Just put it on full rich and run as hard as you can. Get as big an advantage as possible over the rest of the field. He and Moreno now eight seconds ahead of Damata and the rest. And that was 10.2, so it wasn't an empty fuel tank, but close. So Junkera, his teammate, already has stopped. Now Gidley has stopped. And anticipating the leaders of the race, you got a glimpse there of all of the crews with tires on the wall ready to jump over at any time. You can see Gidley coming right out in front of his teammate, Jankara. Would have been interesting to see how the exit of that corner would have come out. Jankara with a lot more momentum. And here is the leader, Jill DeFerrin, on the pit road. Penske seems to like the last pits at Surfer's Paradise. Straight run out to the track from here. Should be able to accelerate at full chant from here. That's exactly it. You don't have to worry about the pit speed limiter on the way out at this track. You just stand on the gas and off you go. Paul Tracy also stopping. His teammate Frank Keedy stopped a lap ahead of him. John Anderson on the radio to Paul Tracy from Australia, as well as his team owner Barry Green, their home race. Max Pappas in. Roberto Moreno has stayed out, assumed the lead. Rest up. Watch Barrett, watch Barrett. Watch Amazing, Barrett. very few changes going on on pit road, at least for the wings. Doesn't mean they're not changing tire pressures, but very few aerodynamic changes. Again, about an 11 second stop for Pappas. A 50 mile an hour tire scrub on the way out here. I mean, you're sitting there with the pit speed limiter on, you don't have much to do, so you might as well. <laughs> Except scare the guys that are laid out as you go by. Yeah, that'll get them back down off the wall. Roberto Moreno. The leader most likely will come in. Sure enough, there's a key part right there. How fast can you get it slowed down to the 50 mile per hour speed limit without speeding as you cross that line? Moreno able to get an, another lap more than Jill DeFerrin. Moreno has always gotten superb fuel mileage. Now we had 12.6 for DeFerrin, so let's see what this is now for Moreno. He'd need to be a couple seconds faster. Trouble hooking up the fuel. Oh, yeah. Finally gets it in. Yeah, so this will be slower. See, they got done with the tires nice and early, but they're having to wait because the fuel didn't flow. Boy, that's going to be very costly at 15.3. Yeah, take four and a half seconds off of that as they had trouble getting the fuel hose hooked. Tagliani also pits. But look at that, Moreno wow, how comes that? out in front of DeFerrin, How's even it? with that long stop. And we saw how much time he did lose because they were almost eight seconds in front of Cristiano Damata. Damata exited right behind Moreno, but how wow. in the world did he get out in front of Gilles DeFerrin? 
Well, I'm checking his fastest lap, and boy, he must have really laid it down on his in-lap. His in-lap was very, very fast. It was the fastest lap of the race, in fact, and that's the lap that you have to do it on. As you said, Jan, he was able to get down to that 50-mile-an-hour speed limit in the minimum amount of time on the track. He was able to gain all the time that he lost on to Farron. We watched Fittipaldi exit his pit stop. Kenny Brack, Elio Castroneves, Michael Andretti, and Cristiano D'Amata have also completed their stops. There's one other thing, Parker, and that is you have to remember that the Farron does one lap with a fuel... Uh-oh. Oh, Dario Franchitti. Pretty precarious position looking for damage on the car. Oh! That's not where you want to be. Uh-oh, come on. That's right on the exit of a blind corner that's turn four coming out of the back straightaway. Oh, man. Please right go in reverse. Guzman. It takes two hands to get it into reverse. You have to take your left hand and pull a lever and then continue to press forward with your right. And sometimes it's tough to get. Frankini still hasn't found it. Yeah, you grab that T-handle, you've got that lever forward. You're trying to work a very, very stiff clutch, which engages like a light switch with an engine that doesn't like revving down low to try to back it up carefully. you got to steer with your knees if you can. Well, you've got... Now, here, here's what happened. This brings out the full course caution. Just a quick little spin. And fortunately, he doesn't touch anything. The wall or Jordan when he came past. Now, these guys are golden now because they were able to pit. Now, the uh -oh. pits, of course, closed as soon as the the twin yellow flags came out but not always but these guys if they were committed to the pits would be okay that's something we're gonna have to find out right what they do well, what, well that was nice uh -oh. of Jordan. okay <laughs> <laughs> it's shorter this way and what i was starting to say paul is that they do not have to necessarily go and close the pits on a road course when they get a full course caution only if they think they're going to trap people who don't otherwise have an opportunity to know that they can pit. And in this case, they probably had to decide to go full course caution immediately and therefore close the pits. Watching this again, you can see Dario right behind Tagliani. Looks like contact yeah, with the left it. rear on the wall. That's what I thought I saw the first time. Tries to stand on the gas to loop it around. Jordan in his 100th start today. Has his heart in his throat there just for a moment. Frankini gets the wheel straight, wisely backs it up. But now... Still trying to figure out how to back that car up, and we saw he went a lap down as the pace car went by. And we are getting the reports from Australia that uh, Jimmy Vassar's team, Patrick Gracing, is upset with that closure of the pits and, and how it came out. It apparently affected them adversely, and we'll wait and see if that has any impact on the race itself. At Surfer's Paradise, Australia, Scott Dixon's going to head into the pits. He had his fuel alarm going off before the full course caution came out, picked up the lead of the race. It caught him and Jimmy Vassar out. Now they're able to make their stops, and we mentioned that the Patrick Racing Team was very concerned. Look at all the dust come off of the brakes on that car. The Patrick Racing Team was complaining about the fact that the pits were closed. And the reason they're complaining is because for Scott Dixon and for Jimmy Vassar and those who had not pitted, it was a huge advantage as Vassar beats Dixon out. It would have been a huge advantage that they had not pitted when they hit the full course caution. So they come around the final corner, they go, Yahoo, I'm going to get in here and get my pit work done, and they close the pits. And now look at the track position they've lost. Scott Dixon comes in in the lead. Now he was running in seventh place when this whole thing happened. He would have gained significant track position if he was able to pit without that closure, but now he's going to go to the back of the line with Jimmy Vassar. And there is Frankiti. They're trying to get him started, but they had him sitting so long. Hot weather, hot engine. You saw that it was beginning to percolate into the overflow, and so you assume it did the same in the fuel lines, and now they're going to have a very troublesome time getting Frankiti restarted if they do at all. Well, the NHRA is flying down the Las Vegas Strip. Catch all the action of the AC Delco Nationals tonight at 7 Eastern for Pacific on ESPN2. The championship battle in top fuel tight. Kenny Bernstein and Larry Dixon see who can get the edge. The AC Delco Las Vegas Nationals on ESPN2 at 7 Eastern tonight. For more, log on to ESPN.com. 
The pit summary, which started at lap 19, covers the first stop of the race. Look down at Jim Karen Barron, big winners. They both won six. Dixon, with that problem, with the strategy and the closure of the pits, as we talked about, lost seven places. And you look at the very top there, Moreno and DeFerrin. Again, to summarize that, what happened was DeFerrin left the pits with a heavy fuel load and cold tires, and Moreno stayed out and drove a brilliant lap. So what happened was, although Moreno had a slower pit stop, he made up the time because he was on a light fuel load, made up more than two seconds on the racetrack versus DeFerrin because DeFerrin's out there running heavy. The very likable Alex Barron in his first ride in uh, Larry Flair's car started in the last row, is up in 12th place now. Elio Castroneves, they report his last stop was timed. They sent Carpentier to the back of the field for entering a closed pit, and now we're ready to go again. Green flag is out. And they are underway this time with Roberto Moreno, the pole sitter in the lead. Great restart by Roberto Moreno. As we saw at the start of the race, Roberto Moreno appears to be quicker. Oh, oh look oh. at Cass Nevis and Kenny Breck. Uh-oh. Drop back, Kenny. You're going to get a penalty. You, you better let him slide through there, and he does. Yep. You're allowed to do that as long as you do not improve time or position, and you correct it, which and he has done. To avoid the contact, he did the wise thing, then just dropped back behind Cass Nevis. But as I was saying, Moreno was quicker on full tanks, fresh tires, but as the run went on, we saw Gilles DeFerrin getting quicker and quicker. It'll be interesting to see how these two run at the front, or if Gilles DeFerrin now will drop back and simply pace behind Roberto Moreno. Pappas and Fittipaldi in a pretty good battle right behind this. That's a battle really for ninth place. And from time to time, you catch Fittipaldi. Look at him. He comes out, tries to get inside of Pappas. Pappas tried to get inside of his own teammate, Kenny Breck, two corners ago. And you have to be very careful at surfers. The roads are crowned so steeply that especially on cold tires with low pressures and full fuel, they run these cars as low to the ground as possible to maximize ground effects, the total downforce the car produces. You get on top of that crown trying to pass, the car will bottom. you lose braking and steering control. So Christian Fittipaldi continuing to work. Here is that situation, Castro Nevis and Kenny Breck. Now, as long as Kenny drops back in position and he does slow, lets Castro Nevis go by, no harm, no foul. And that was a no-win situation for Breck. He couldn't have tried to take that corner. There would have been contact. He made the smart move. I think we're seeing Kenny, though, with a different mindset. At Laguna Seca, he was very aggressive. He knew that he had to push hard. And unfortunately, contact knocked him out of the race right from the get-go. I think what you're seeing here is he knows he can't win this race. The only way he stays alive in the championship is if something happens to DeFerrin and he just keeps his car on the road. But the way he's sitting right now, he's in desperate trouble with the championship unless something bad happens to DeFerrin. Yeah, let's talk about that championship because we always track the points as they are run you see Breck currently sits 38 points back he can't do that he's got to be less than 22 23 when he comes out of this race if he wants any chance at all of going against DeFerrin Pappas and Fittipaldi at it again Ooh. and Fontana the California Speedway where he'd really like to be because he does so very well on ovals and conversely so poorly on road courses but remembering too that Kenny Breck last year look at Pappas use that curb Kenny Breck last year here finished second watch Max Pappas defending the inside there a few corners back you've got to be very careful here the entry speed to these chicanes is very very fast it's where all the times made he's taking a defensive line down the inside puts them in very early to the corner you clip the curb there it'll throw you right into the exit wall you can see Fittipaldi now starting to catch back up, trying to figure out how to utilize his advantage to make a run on Max Pappas. Reminder at the front, Moreno, DeFerrin, DeMata, Tracy Tagliani. Those are your top five. Back on board with Junquera. Junquera is 11th. His teammate, Memo Gidley, is right behind him. The last few races, though, Paul, you were talking about keeping championship hopes alive. We've seen such strange results. We've seen Mimo Gidley qualify 23rd now, three times in a row. The last two races, he's ended up on the podium. Max Pappas, as we've said, coming from the back to win Laguna Seca. So I think Jan's absolutely right. Kenny Brexter's trying to keep it clean. Hopes that there's some misfortune that befalls Gilles DeFerrin. 
and then tries to capitalize on that to take enough points away to keep his championship hopes alive into Fontana next weekend. Now, right here is where we saw Frankiti run into trouble. So I'm starting the stopwatch. The reason being is that that's where Frankiti got into trouble. Was there enough time for Cart to make a decision to go full course caution and leave the pits open? Well, I think that's about the halfway point. That's exactly as far away diagonally from the pit in as you can get way down there in turn number four. Well, we're up to 24 seconds and counting. So the point I'm making is that Cart went full course caution and the reason they closed the pits, they did not want to strand somebody at the front of the field leaving him without an opportunity to pit. But because Vassar and Dixon were upset, that means they had plenty of time to come onto pit well, road. You can see how much time there is. Well, we're up to 45 seconds, so you can understand why Jimmy Vassar and also Scott Dixon were upset. They thought the pit should stay open because there should have been plenty of time for them to hit pit road. Watching further back in the field, and speaking of Jimmy Vassar, there he is. That is Alex Barron, just ahead of Vassar. Barron given that car a great ride. He has a two-race opportunity to prove himself as he is replacing Max Wilson in the cockpit of that machine. So it's Moreno, DeFerrin, DeMata, Toyota, Honda, Toyota, top three, the Grand Prix of Australia, the CART FedEx Championship Series. She wore white? She put her past behind her. But you're missing the point of the story. The groom's father-in-law hires him to run the mismanaged shipping department of the family business. No honeymoon? A week in the wild. That's nice. It's not bad, but keep up. The kid turns to FedEx ground. They give him affordable nationwide B2B delivery with a money-back guarantee. And he gives Daddy Dearest a high-quality, low-cost lesson in who's the boss. Who is the boss? The kid. The kid is now the, the boss? The kid is now the boss. That's the story? That's it. What would happen if an SUV were raised by a family of sports cars? The 200 horsepower Mazda Tribute. The SUV with the soul of a sports car. I've been racing for 36 years. There's one thing that I've learned. Racing is all about trust. Trust in your crew. Trust in your car. Most importantly, trust in your tires. We race on Firestone. We're committed to building quality tires. Because whether you're going over 200 miles per hour or just going home, it's all about trust. Chris Berman and analyst Tom Jackson as they break down all the NFL action on NFL prime time. Sunday night, 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. The most comprehensive NFL highlight show on television. NFL prime time presented by Miller Lite every Sunday, 7.30 Eastern on ESPN. For more, log on to ESPN.com. Paul Page, Parker Johnstone, Jan Vikas. The CART FedEx Championship Series, one more race after this to go, but today, Surfers Paradise Australia. Roberto Moreno is in front. Since we've left you, there have been no changes in the field. Jill DeFerrin sits in second place, followed by Cristiano DeMata. There's DeMata, Paul Tracy, Alex Tagliani, and Michael Andretti. Currently in the championship fight, if everything remains the same, Jill DeFerrin will be hoisting the Vanderbilt Cup, symbol of the champion, aloft at the end of this race. Look at titles still available. Of course, the Drivers' Championship. Scott Dixon looking to wrap up the rookie title. Honda clinched its fourth Manufacturers' Championship in her last race at Laguna. It's sixth Drivers' Championship for Honda. And Renard has won the Constructors' Championship. So we're looking at the Drivers' Championship and the rookie title here possibly being sewn up at Surfers Paradise. The biggest move, as we look at the recap, comes from Alex Barron. We mentioned that a few moments ago. He's given that car a great ride and uh, hopefully trying to tap down a permanent seat for next year. Three changes among the leaders, though DeFerrin has dominated it. And we've had two cautions. And both of them, the flags thrown rather early. Apparently a great deal of concern in race control over the narrowness of this track.
mentioned earlier, Roberto Moreno being so good on full tanks, fresh tires. He's now three and a half seconds ahead of Gilles DeFerrin. We'll see if this interval closes. As this run progresses, Cristiano D'Amato, though, hanging on to the back of DeFerrin, just under a second behind him. Now, we also talk about, Parker, we have talked about how Moreno took the lead. And you've talked about how he's good on cold tires. That's what a lot of people talk about. What separates the men from the boys is going out on a full tank of fuel on cold tires. And if you're running for a championship, you don't take a big risk. You don't go out there and just hang it all out. But Moreno could, and it certainly paid off. Absolutely. I mean, we used to comment about Juan Montoya's ability on the starts and the restarts and after these pit stops to just pull out huge intervals on the rest of the field. But you're right, here when you're lined with concrete walls, there's no reason to take a risk when you know that that million dollar championship looms just in front of you. A little while ago, they were reporting that Horatio Guzman's engine was running rough. Uh, he's anticipating a pit stop in the next few moments here. And again, when we show you in the upper left-hand corner, the uh, full field summary as we watch Guzman come in, the boxes that are yellow background, those are the three drivers who are in contention for the championship at this race. There's a very bad sign. Mauricio Guzman's had a tough weekend. He's got a small chip fracture of his right hand, suffered earlier in the weekend. And what you saw him pull off there was helicopter rotor tape. And they use it on all the cars, is that on any seam on the car, you'll put this very sticky, very strong tape that will that's why they put it on helicopter rotors it protects them and that helps keep the body work on and you got to peel that off before you can get under the bonnets i use it on my laptop to keep the battery in it doesn't work <laughs> there is also a report coming from surfers paradise now complaints by the letterman ray hall team kenny breck in particular that he feels like elio castro nevis is blocking him little team orders going on you think well, it's not necessary. Yeah, of course not. Uh, They're in the fight for second in the championship, if not the championship itself. Gaston Evans is just not going to move over and let Kenny Breck by. He's going to make him work for it. Well, he, he's definitely driving defensively. And what you do, the first thing you do is you get on the radio and you say the guy's blocking me. Well, you start doing that when you're about 10 car lengths behind him. Right. You start setting the stage when you're not even close to passing Hope, the guy. Right. Hoping that Cart will contact the team and say, we're watching for blocking. That gets him distracted. Then you can go for the big move and just dart your way up the inside. Well, we saw Casanevas locking up that left front wheel. But the Cart rulebook states you can make one move. It's not considered blocking unless you react to the change of position of the car that's following you. So for Cash Nevis, if he wants to drive down the inside, that's his right to drive there. But he can't change line in reaction to Kenny Breck repositioning in his car in an attempt to pass. So is that two moves in a chicane? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! Whoa! I don't know, but Cash Nevis is definitely trying to stand on it. And this is very unlike Castro Nevis style. He starts pushing a little bit hard, starts Maybe feeling a little pressure from behind, he's going to start scrubbing some speed. It, Kenny Breck's getting out, out of his rhythm. Now, Kenny Breck just has to figure out how to take advantage of these small mistakes that Castro Nevis is making. Now, remember early on, there was a radio communication that Castro Nevis was losing power. That was what he thought was inhibiting him. Now, if you're a little bit low on power, you have to drive defensively because you think you can push it in the corners. but. If you don't, you're going to be a dead duck down the straightaway. Well, I don't know. I watched him go down that last straightaway behind Kenny Bre or in front of Kenny Breck. Kenny Breck certainly, uh, with Ford Power, has got plenty of top line speed. We're not seeing him close that interval going down those straightaways. Here's where Elio Castro Nevis just totally lost the back end and caught it. You love it when you're looking out the side of the cockpit to see where your nearest competitor is in front of you. And it's easy to do there. Big crown on the road, similar to sort of the leaps you do at Mid-Ohio. And if you don't have the car set up properly, as you come over the top on power, the back you must step out. Now, Parker, we've talked about the fact that maybe he's low on power. Remember, they are telling us that he did not take on a full load of fuel, so his car will be lighter than Kenny Breck's. And battle continues to move down on top of sixth place, Michael Andretti. It's Moreno. DeFerrin, DeMata, Tracy Tagliani. The country famous for kangaroos, Australia. Kangaroos, koalas, and of course, Surfer's Paradise. We'll be back. For our first Toyota Spotlight, we want to take a look at Jill DeFerrin. What a wonderful run he has had this year. Remember the run at Rockingham in England? Houston, all the action. 
And then he comes up on top. Laguna Seca, another good run. All of these have kept a Baron that consistency in the championship fight. At Surfer's Paradise, the view is Dario Franchitti. The car off into one of the runoff areas. A bit of smoke from the back of the car, and Dario has climbed out. And Mauricio Guzman getting out as well. Guzman, the report had been the engine was running rough. It'll be a painful day. You notice he'll favor the right wrist. Got a chip bone on that wrist due to accident at Surfers in the practice. Michael Andretti, sixth position. That battle continues behind him. Elio Castroneves and Kenny Breck, despite complaints of, we'll put it in quotation marks, blocking by Castroneves. No action has been taken, so apparently the chief steward Chris Neifel and his staff have not yet seen an action that they believe to be blocking, at least enough of an action that they would take some sort of penalty during the race. On board with last year's winner, Adrian Fernandez, started in 17th position, currently running in 18th. And if it's a bit of a prediction to the end of this race, Fernandez won last year on a really brilliant fuel strategy. And often figuring out how to time those pit stops, when to bring them in and how much fuel to give them. Of course, you have to start with a full fuel load. They're going to look at that as a rule for next year and uh, maybe put all of the fuel in the pit side tank and let you uh, start, start the race with a short fuel if you want to. But uh, under the current rules, you start with a full 35 gallons on board. But still, fuel strategy is really a very interesting game. A lot of consideration being given to try to take out the driver adjustability of the mixture control. They're having problems policing right now any of the electronics. I think that might be difficult to do. But certainly, they need to do something to take away the luck that's involved, or the pure luck that we've seen in the last few races of just having to hit the yellows at the right time so that kind of alleviates engineering skill, driving skill, team's ability to do pit stops. Just being in the right place at the right time has worked out more often than not to determine the winner. Running yeah. down at this point, the Esplanade, the Pacific Ocean is just off to your right. This one's 60 miles an hour in second gear in qualifying, but you tend to use third gear in the race. If you go up one gear, you get better fuel economy. And certainly that was a nice... Elio Castroneves just ran off course. Was third in the championship. He and Breck, the only two drivers that could uh, challenge to Farron, but I'm afraid... Yeah, yeah that he's saying done. that's it. International sign for I killed it. <laughs> Spun it, motors down, and that could spell the end of any hope, as faint as it may have been for a championship for Elio Castroneves. He wants to get going again, but he really needs to be up winning this race. Look at that. Just locks up the rear brakes on the way in. Can't make the corner, tries to keep it off the tires, does a nice job there. Now, if they go full course caution, they're in a window. If they go full course caution, expect everybody to come in and try and fill that thing up with fuel. Yeah, no? he just carried a huge amount of speed into that corner. There was no way he was gonna make it. it was all over the binders, was very, very fortunate not to hit anything. He made a, a last-minute decision there, started to back it up, and then he stalled it. They're still waving yellow flags only in that area of the uh, track. He got off the edge, but look at everybody that anticipated, yeah. perhaps, the yellow. They thought it was going to come out. Yeah, and I wonder if... Boy, you sure hope there wasn't a miscommunication to where maybe they said they were going to go full course and change their mind, because otherwise, these guys are up the creek. It's, what's your best guess, guys, about five laps before they would have to come in? And this group could even wait, some of these guys, till a bit later than that. Well, the math is pretty easy here. They have to go 24 laps. They can do that, but they're really going to have to stretch. We've seen guys with help from the yellow come in on lap 22, 23. So they, yeah. uh, they're going to have to do a splash and go at the end unless we've got another yellow. Well, they just... You flat don't pit unless you think it's going to go full course yellow. So either they were rolling the dice and gambling that they were going to throw it, or they got some bad communication. We saw Carpante, one of those cars that came into the pits. Remember, he was penalized for coming in as the pits closed. So I think they simply took a gamble and they lost. Moreno now 6.2 seconds out ahead of DeFerrin. 
Damata, 1.2 seconds behind DeFerrin. So Moreno now extending his lead. Remember, Moreno scored a victory at Vancouver this year. All of his victories have come on temporary circuits, and he's looking so very strong here. Better get the Kleenex box ready, Paul. <laughs> Remember, he's uh, been in the series off and on, nine seasons full-time in the season. But uh, he drove his first race in the series in 1985. Castro Nevis, they did get restarted, and he's back rolling again. As we mentioned, Jourdain and Moreno, this is their 100th start. As you said, Moreno starting back in 85. Oh! Jourdain got to 100 starts starting from 1996. Get a big tank slapper in the middle of one of these chicanes, and uh, that, that'll get your heart going. <laughs> That was quite a moment for Tagliani. He was looking down like he was trying to find a gear. Well, that's not where you go looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> Remember his teammate, Carpentier, crashed at Nazareth because he had his head down in the cockpit looking at the display as he went into a corner. And Pat looked at me afterwards and said, well, you know how that is. And I said, no, I don't. Well, I